Right, um, so can I tell you where we're trying to get to today? You should have a copy of this, short extract from the investigations by Wittgenstein, and we're going to try to understand one paragraph from it and look a little bit at a couple of others. But in order to do this, I need to just take you through a little bit of the background. And some of you know quite a lot about Wittgenstein. I think a lot of people probably don't. So some of this is very quick background to Wittgenstein. OK, so meaning and the following of a rule. Meaning and the following of a rule. Some people know how to follow the rule. Others don't. Some people understand the joke from the 80s in English TV. Others don't, because they weren't there at the time. Who's on the inside and who's on the outside? Uh, this is Husserl, and that's Bertrand Russell, who were both writing around the same time, the beginning of the 20th century. And there are their dates. This is Wittgenstein, who came into philosophy largely because of Bertrand Russell. He was Austrian, but he spent most of his working life in Cambridge in the philosophy department. And that's Heidegger, who we've been talking about at the same time. Both Wittgenstein and Heidegger are writing in German, but in totally different traditions. And you see one line of influence on the left there, and one on the right. Wittgenstein and Heidegger were born in the same year, 1889. Okay. Now, Wittgenstein's work falls into two phases, speaking very, very loosely. First of all, we've got the book called The Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, based on a title by Spinoza. And in that, he set out a particular theory of meaning. He was trying to understand the nature of meaning and how meaningful expressions worked. His later work really crystallizes in a book that was published two years after he died called The Philosophical Investigations. And it's really very different from the former book. So in the Tractatus, we have what is known as the picture theory of meaning. That's what is commonly used as a shorthand expression. So words refer to things. They name objects, table, bag, screen. And then combinations of words make up propositions. Propositions match states of affairs in the world whether something is the case or not. So the cup is on the table. The cup is on the table, there it is. The bottle is on the table, and it seems to be true, that proposition, for most of the tables in front of you. OK, the matching of words and things, and the matching of propositions with states of affairs. So in the philosophical investigations, he almost completely rejects his earlier self and instead, he comes out with the idea that meaning doesn't work through a picturing relationship or a matching relation. To understand the nature of meaning, we need to think of meaning as use. To understand a word is to be able to use it correctly or appropriately. To understand a word is something, it depends upon something you can do. So it's to know how to go on in ways others will recognize. So if I use the word hasugashi appropriately, then you'll understand what I mean. If I used it to mean something quite different, then it would cease to be working as a word. It would cease to work in the language we use. Hasugashi is the word that means something like modesty or perhaps embarrassment. So the start of the investigations, I'm going to talk about the later work, which is more relevant to what we're talking about today. The start of the philosophical investigations uh, is very significant. Much of Wittgenstein's later work is a criticism of his earlier views, as I said. And he begins the investigations, not in his own voice, but with an extended quote from St. Augustine. And St. Augustine's writing about the learning of a language. Augustine's thinking about how, not how you might learn French or, or Greek or something like that, but rather how we come into our first language, our initial learning of language. And Augustine has this passage which Wittgenstein uses at the start of his text, and it begins as follows. When they, my elders, 
named some objects and accordingly moved towards something, I saw this and I grasped that the thing was called by the sound they uttered when they meant to point it out. So you see the picture. Augustine says, someone said, table, screen, ceiling, and so on. And by that means of having something pointed to, then named, he learned the language. Now, in other words, the adults in a community, the community could be the family, it could be something looser and larger, of course. The adults point to objects and name them. This is a process of ostensive definition. And ostension means showing by pointing. Ostensive teaching, rather. So what's wrong with the picture of learning, the learning of language which we've just considered, which Augustine presents? The teacher, the adult, the adult points, screen, table, chair, and the learner picks up those words. What's wrong with that? Well, it, ma it makes it seem as though all words are names of objects. But what about words such as because, and, sometimes, and very? You can't point to very, can you? You can't point to sometimes or because. And what about numbers? Can we point to numbers? Because sometimes we use numbers in a sequence, the fifth one in the sequence. Sometimes we refer to five objects. Sometimes we do calculations with numbers that work quite differently. It's very hard to point to numbers. And what about color words? Red, white, and so on. But am I pointing to the bag, or to the color, to the ceiling, or to the color? And whenever you point to red, it's always a red something, isn't it? So I can't point to red without pointing to the bag or to someone's shirt or whatever it may be. So the second thing we would worry about is this, that Augustine's account presumes that the practice of pointing is already understood. But you think about this. If we say rouge, blanc, and so on, if I say that, then you will very quickly learn some French words if you don't know them already. So it works with second language learning. We can point a name and you can learn quite a lot that way. But imagine the young child who doesn't, who's coming new into language, new into thought. How do they know what this means? What this means? What this means? How do they know that I'm not pointing this way, or that I'm just stretching my finger? How do they know that I'm supposed to look down here to the thing at the end? Do you understand that? The thing that we take for granted in pointing, the young child doesn't yet understand that practice. So Augustine seems to have missed that. Of course, it's also more complicated because when I point to something, I could be meaning surface, color, table, hardness, all sorts of possibilities. So note that the general practice is not really a problem with second language learning, the practice of ostensive teaching. Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein's concern is with something more basic. How do we come into the, our, our lives as human beings? Because language is so fundamental to our coming into a human world, a world with others. So let's imagine an example, Wittgenstein says, of how a primitive language might function. A very basic language for, see if we can imagine a people for whom this was the total language. So paragraph two of the Philosophical Investigations includes this. He writes, it's not on your sheet, it's not on your sheet, okay? Let us imagine a language for which the description given by Augustine is right. The language is meant to serve for communication between a builder, called A, and an assistant, called B. A is building with building stones. And there are blocks of building stone, pillars, columns, 
slabs, big flat pieces, and beams to support a roof, for example. Blocks, pillars, slabs, beams. B has to pass the stones, and that in the order in which A names them. So A will call out block, slab, or whatever, then B will bring them. For this purpose, they use a language consisting of the words block, pillar, slab, beam. A calls them out, B brings the stone, which he's learnt to bring at such and such a call. And Wittgenstein says, conceive this as a complete primitive language. Have you got the picture then? It's a kind of thought experiment. Can we imagine a tribe, a group of people, a society, in which there were just four words. Okay, can I carry on? Well, what's the point of the example of the builders? A huge literature has been written on this example. Initially, what the builders are doing is plausible. It's believable. Wittgenstein asked you to imagine that tribe and for a second, at least, you could picture someone saying block and someone going to fetch a block. But these are the only words, and maybe the only concepts, that the builders use. So how can we make sense of what they're doing? For example, block, that's the big square one, does this mean, bring me the block? If someone says block, does this mean, bring me the block? Or that block should go there? Or the block is on my foot? Or what? Okay, so if we had the word block, or suppose I suddenly said chair, and probably you'd realize the chair was on my foot or something. Or chair, bring me the chair. We can imagine that in the context of our language but for the builder's language game, they only have these four words. None of these thoughts seems to be available to the builders because they simply have this single, these four single words. So another problem here is, what are the builders doing? They're building a house, or a wall, or a temple? But none of these thoughts would be available to them. So this building activity is not anything, sorry, is nothing like what we mean by building. Ordinarily, if you build something, it's as a wall, as a house, and that involves lots of other thoughts. We couldn't get to that if we only had the single words. Okay, words and practices. So they, on my account then, and which I think is the mainstream account, the builder's language doesn't really make sense. We thought we could imagine this people, which only had four words, but the more we try to, the less plausible it becomes, the less realistic. It's as though Wittgenstein's taken us down a path and then shown that that path is blocked. So words and practices, how does this come into it? Well, in a sense, understanding a word or a sentence means understanding a language as a whole. This is why we cannot have block in isolation, and we can't have red in isolation without green, yellow, purple, and so on. A word is used in the context of a practice. So if I know what pencil means, there must be a variety of things I can do. I can fetch the pencil, or draw with it, or write with it, or break it, or chew it and I shall know what paper is, and so on. You couldn't really know what a pencil was unless you knew that it was for writing. Okay? And when I learn what a pencil is, so I suppose I'm two or three years old, I'm learning what a pencil is, I know how to go on in an appropriate way with the pencil. To go on in an appropriate way, someone says, fetch the pencil, so I go and fetch it and maybe at around age three, I'm able to use the word correctly. But what counts as correctly, what counts as correctly will gradually develop and become refined. Because I might, 
when asked to get a pencil, I might fetch this, which is a pen, of course, isn't it? But with a three-year-old, you'd be happy with that response. You'd accept them getting the pen and not the pencil, as we would more accurately describe it. So he's talking about then words being understood in terms of practices. You don't just know what pencil is by the correlation of a name with a thing. It depends upon the practice of using a pencil, the kinds of things that we do that surround these words. The same would apply with chair or sit up or eat your food and so on. There are practices involved. So Wittgenstein refers to such holistic practices as language games. Why does he say that? Well, to call them games is not intended to trivialize them as mere play. The point is rather to stress that their holistic nature. So scoring a goal makes no sense unless there is the whole practice of soccer. Scoring a goal by itself wouldn't make sense. You need the whole practice. And knowing what a pencil is wouldn't make sense without the other things. But the other reason for using this word game is because if you think of ordinary games like chess, soccer, tennis, card games, dressing up games, rugby, word games, then they're all games, but you're struck by their variety. The variety in the ordinary sense is like the variety of things we do with words. And just will notice one other thing about those games. Although you know they're all games, there is nothing they have in common. So soccer is a bit like rugby, but rugby is nothing like a word game. And word games are different from dressing up games or from chess. So there are overlaps, but no common element. And that relates to language too, because in language we seem to be using words all the time so we assume, we assume they must all function in the same way. But let's take an example here. I'm going to use an expression, I believe, in two different contexts. So the expression, I believe that. I believe that today is the 12th of December. And I believe that Jesus is my saviour. In the first of those contexts, if you tell me, no, you're, you're being stupid, it's not the 12th, it's the 13th today, I may say, oh yes, silly me, of course, we met last on the 11th, it's the 13th today. But if you tell me that Jesus is not my saviour, and I say, oh, silly me, then I haven't understood that expression, have I? Because in order to say, I believe that Jesus is my saviour appropriately or meaningfully, it must be tied into my life as a whole and various other practices in a very serious way. So the surface expression of the signs, I believe that, has a quite different effect according to the different language games in which it occurs. So we have the same expression, but the practices within which each is located are totally different. And language games overlap in numerous ways, but there is no system to them and they have no common essence. There's nothing common to them all. What we're developing then is a picture of language, an account of language, which is much more varied and it varies according to the diversity of practices in which human beings are engaged. This is totally unlike the picture theory of meaning, which had a kind of systematic unity to it. All the different names and propositions fitted together in a more or less logical range of connections. So language games and following a rule. I've used the expression following a rule. I learn what a pencil is. I know how to use the word correctly following the rule of how you use the word pencil, which we are all um, adept at using. We know what pencils are. Words function like that. So to come into a language game is to learn how to go on in the appropriate way. Learning how to carry on, how to do the right thing, how to go on next. With pencils, 
with spoons. So it's not just about using the word spoon, it's also about using spoons, which you're taught to do when, in, in some cultures at least, you're taught to do when you're very small. And your teacher will say, or your parent will say, don't hold it like that, hold it like this. They'll guide your hand. Gradually the word spoon will be used, but all of this is still within a linguistic context. So we learn what to do with pencils, with spoons, with sitting on a chair, which isn't natural, it's something we learn, with playing soccer, so that when a little child first kicks a ball, they aren't really playing soccer, but you gradually shape their behavior until they can follow the rules and score goals and so on. And also with philosophy, because you come into the study of a subject and you learn the kinds of concepts that are operating within the subject, the arguments that uh, are, are, are uh, constructed, and the way to speak appropriately to that subject. So it's to learn to follow rules. But that's too quick so far, because sometimes rules are very rigid, but mostly, and especially in language, mostly they are open to development. Let's consider some examples. 2468, what comes next? Tell me. Thank you, right, so 10, 12, 14, 16. So you've all spotted the rule, it came very naturally to you. I imagine you all had the same sequence in mind when you saw that. But of course, we can do this differently. 2, 4, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, 20. 24, 28, 32, 36, 41, 46, 51, now I'm getting lost. Okay, so the rule was to add after each four digits to increase the number by which you're adding. So you could see the rule. We could play games like this. We could try this one next. 2, 4, 6, 8, 4, 16, 36, 64. Or we could say 2, 4, 6, 8, Nauco, 10, 12, 14, 16, Marinette, and so on. After every fourth digit, adding by two, say someone's name. That would be following the rule. So we can expand the rule in unprecedented ways. You've never heard that sequence I've just come out with. It's sending, sending Nauco to sleep. So, <laughs> I'm even talking about you and you're going to sleep. <laughs> okay, oh no, it's gone. Oh. <laughs> so, variations on a theme. So we've just shown how we can play a game with those numbers. And just think how important this is for thought. So I'm going to fast forward to a quite different aspect of human experience. And uh, Adrian and I were talking about jazz being played in coffee bars here and so on, which is great from my point of view. And there's John Coltrane. So John Coltrane, the great saxophonist, would take a jazz standard, a jazz tune, a familiar song, and then make incredible elaborations on it. So he takes the rather sugary song, My Favourite Things, and turns that into extraordinary sound by all the variations he develops. He's doing the same kind of thing as we were doing when we were playing with 2468, except at a vastly more complex level. Bach does this with theme and variations. It's the way music is the way creative thought so often works. And there's Kandinsky, and Kandinsky wrote this book about painting and drawing, and he called point and line to plane, showing how the rhythm is built up by the repetition of lines and then breaks in the repetition of lines. You see those diagonal lines down the bottom. If you increase the number, it alters the, the appearance significantly. So, Stanley Cavell talks about these things, and he talks about these in relation to young children. Some of you know this, so apologies for repetition. But he talks about the way that when the young child uses a word, the word isn't just repeated in the way that a parrot repeats a word, or a computer can repeat a word, say. The young child picks up the word and projects it, throws it forward into unforeseen uses. In a sense, they're doing what John Coltrane does, 
and they're doing what we all do all the time because as you know we all utter original sentences we say new things all the time so he asks us to imagine a child and i'm varying the example slightly but it's halloween and someone points to an object it might be saint augustine and says pumpkin so there is the pumpkin which you see a lot at halloween you have that here too don't you but you don't see pumpkins like that Anyway, you know this is the custom in, in the United States in particular. So the child sees the pumpkin, and the child's not heard the word pumpkin before, and is rather interested by it. Pumpkin, he says. Pumpkin, 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 pumpkin. Why is this strange large orange object called a pumpkin? And this strange sound opens chains of association. Because he knows that sometimes balls are pumped up and so the pumpkin looks as though it's pumped up. He makes that connection. And by coincidence, Mr. Popkin lives next door, and Mr. Popkin looks a bit like a pumpkin. Right? So the child makes these chains of association, which are, if you like, wrong, but they're projecting the word in new ways, opening it to new associations. Cavell talks about his daughter. So his daughter, when she was about three, learnt the word kitty. That's a uh, child's word for a baby cat okay and then likes the word kitty and then when she sees this she says kitty she's heard that word in connection with that and then she sees that and she says kitty and kitty and kitty and kitty but maybe not with that one because it's not furry is it it's just a cartoon image and she hasn't yet learned to read cartoon images of cats but the point is the word is extended in its connections the child is doing something creative through this this is an invention in the language in the way that we were talking about earlier on now we're coming to notions of conformity and resistance to inclusion and exclusion because i've been talking about coming into a practice where you get a word like pencil and initially you use it about pen and other sticks maybe, other things that you might hold in your hand, but gradually you're made to conform with the way adults, the community, uses the word pencil as opposed to pen. So we're looking at these tensions between inclusion and exclusion. And this is where we're coming close to the section of the investigations we're going to look at and it's a section which refers to the instrument for gardening, the spade. So would you now turn to the text with me, and I'm just going to slow down a tiny bit and take you through three paragraphs here. If you look first of all at paragraph 198, See, one thing you may have noticed when I was talking is that the idea of following a rule has a certain open-endedness to it because 2468 could be followed by 10, 12, 14 or 11, 14 and so on or by 2468, Nalco, 10, 12, 14, Marinette and so on. There are all sorts of things that still make sense as following a rule. But if we got too elaborate in our innovations there, no one would understand. They wouldn't be able to follow on. Okay. Right, just look at 198, the second part of it, where in inverted commas, the question is raised, then can whatever I do be brought into accord with the rule? So it's phrased as a question. And one of the things Wittgenstein does in this book is constantly to set up dialogues in which a voice says something, presented in inverted commas, and then an answer comes to it. Sometimes the answer is settled and resolved, sometimes it's left in such a way that we continue to puzzle. So, can whatever I do be brought into accord with the rule? And the response comes, let me ask this, what has the expression of a rule, say a signpost, got to do with my actions? What sort of connection is there here? Well, perhaps this one. I've been trained to react to this sign in a particular way, and now I do so react to it. But that is only to give a causal condition, to tell how it's come about 
that we now go on by the signpost, not what this going by the sign really consists in. On the contrary, I've further indicated that a person goes by a signpost only insofar as there exists a regular use of signposts, a custom. So the practice we talked about to begin with, pointing to something, screen, and naming it, that is a custom, a practice, into which people are brought. Okay, would you look next at 202, the foot of the next page, and hence also obeying a rule is a practice. And to think one is obeying a rule is not to obey a rule. Hence, it's not possible to obey, obey a rule privately, otherwise thinking one was obeying a rule would be the same thing as obeying it. What's happening here is that the attention's being thrown onto what we do, what others can see us doing, a shared practice of behavior. That is what stabilizes our use of language and thought. Turn over the page to um, long section 208, but I'm going to look at the third paragraph on the uh, uh, right-hand side there. And here he's describing a process of teaching. So you don't tell someone a rule. On the contrary, what often happens is this. I do it, he does it after me, and I influence him by expressions of agreement rejection, expectation, encouragement. I let him go his way or hold him back and so on. Imagine witnessing such teaching. None of the words would be explained by means of itself. There would be no logical circle. The behavior, the reinforcement of behavior, the encouragement of behavior or discouragement would be the crucial thing. If you turn the page now to section 217, This is where we've really been heading with this. Because just as my use of the word green depends upon following a rule for the word green, and if I suddenly start talking about this as green, you'll th think I've gone crazy or there's something wrong with my perception. So my ordinary use of the green depends upon using it in the same kind of range as you will do as well. Well, so also, if I present you with an argument, if I give you my reasons for something, then my reasons can only work if I'm using terms and using forms of reasoning that match your sense of what is coherent, of what makes sense. I've got to be seen to be going on in a reasonable way. But when you talk to somebody, imagine talking to a five-year-old. And five-year-olds go through a phase and they say, why? 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 Whatever you say, they will say, why? And you get fed up with it, so you say, shut up, or you go away, or you do something different, or you turn on a DVD, all right? So you'll come to an end of explanation. This is something Wittgenstein stresses. But now suppose that you're talking with a... Uh, someone who is in South Africa and is in favor of apartheid, of separate development, of black people living in vastly, superior, vastly inferior circumstances. And you say to this person why you think it's wrong, why it's unjust. Can't you see they're human beings just like you and I are, and so on. And you keep giving your reasons and you struggle to defeat them at every point. But there will be a come a point when you think, I can say no more here. I cannot progress with this person. I cannot be in community with this person because they cannot think the way I do. Now remember that example and the other many cases where we run out of things to say. And let's read this passage. How am I to obey, obey a rule? If this is not a question about causes, then it's about the justification for my following this rule in the way I do. My justification for holding these views. That's what I will be giving. Is it 217? 217, yes, okay. 
And in the second paragraph of 217, he says, if I have exhausted the justifications, I have reached bedrock and my spade is turned. Then I'm inclined to say, this is simply what I do. So I'm arguing with the person who is in favor of apartheid. I've tried all my arguments and now I've, I've run out of arguments. I haven't changed my views at all, but nothing I can say is going to persuade this person. So I've reached bedrock. It's the rock bottom of what I can say. I can say no more. Okay. But Wittgenstein uses this expression, I've reached bedrock and my spade is turned. If you look at the image on the screen, this is a practice of digging which maybe most of you have done at some stage or other. The geology is very different here from in Europe and I suspect that it's easier to dig in the soil you have here. Often in Europe there's a mix of clay, roots, stones, bits of rock, and sometimes you're digging smoothly, digging down, turning over, digging down, turning over, and then you go down and your spade hits something hard. When that happens, your hand twists, your spade is turned, and it's an uncomfortable feeling. So the image of bedrock would suggest you've got secure foundations. It would be a foundationist way of thinking, something we can be sure of, we can build from here. But the image of the spade turning is more like an image of frustration. I can't get any further with this person. It's painful. I'm going to have to give up. I'm going to have to do something else. And so Wittgenstein finishes and with the line, this is simply what I do. So could, this is simply what I do can mean this is simply what I believe, that apartheid is deeply wrong. This is simply what I believe. You shouldn't do this or you should do that. I can't see the world differently. Now at that point, there's a break in the extent to which I'm in community with the other person. But at that point, we can see who I might be in community with and who I cannot be in community with. In some ways, at that point, it looks as though I'm isolated. I've lost my community. I need to walk away or to dig somewhere else. I hope this is coming to light. Um, so the passage, which we just looked at then now on the screen, is one that's generated a large and growing literature. One interpretation of this is a, an authoritarian one. That in the end, our conformity is based on adherence to a set pattern. This is simply what we do. Okay, so the, all the rule following that Wittgenstein is talking about, it comes down to a conformity with society's behavior. I've heard this passage quoted as, this is simply what we do. But it's not in fact what Wittgenstein wrote. And the other interpretation would be, yes, I'm struggling to find community with others. And it's something you're doing as a small child when you're arguing with your parents and you can't see sense in what they say. And probably you later on compromise in some way or take a larger view or maybe you break away at some stage. And in terms of the political, it would suggest that in order to be living well within a society, you should be prepared to come to a point where you say, I cannot accept what you're doing. I cannot see things as you do. I've tried my best to articulate my own view and I have to live somewhere else or I have to live separately or I have to do my own thing in some way. But it's a paragraph that depends upon notions of inclusion and exclusion.